Welcome everyone back to the Knuckleball Experience Show. Um, today, our guest is Joe Gannon. Joe's been a knuckleball pitcher at professional ranks for about 12 years. Um, he's got over a thousand innings in and been with uh, the Orioles, White Sox, Atlantic League. And, you know, he's done a lot of coaching and, and scouting. So he's got a wealth of knowledge and we're looking forward to um, what he's got to share with us. And uh, anyway, welcome to the show, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to start to show off how I usually do. And can you tell us about your first experience with the knuckleball when you saw it and, you know, what, what caught your eye about it? Uh, well, when you're growing up, I think every kid picks it up, puts it in their glove and, you know, starts to goof around with it. Um, I didn't really start taking it serious until uh, probably in the early 90s, the Pirates were um, – the triple a team for the uh, Buffalo Bisons were the pirates triple a team. Um, I was the bullpen catcher there. So I was actually a catcher at the time. And one of the guys they brought up was Tim Wakefield. Um, and it was when he was really going good. Uh, he shot up through the ranks. Uh, I was, <laughs> I'd say lucky enough, but unlucky enough to catch him in the bullpen a lot. Uh, got pretty beat up. Um, you know, he was a really good guy, quiet guy, but really good guy. If you asked him a question, he answered it. Um, and then he was still learning. So, you know, the opportunity to sit in a bullpen and listen to coaches, teach him, help him, what his input was, uh, the back and forth of the pitchers uh, between him. And, uh, you know, I was all ears, no mouth. So uh, it was something I was taught a long time ago. So I was lucky because I was a sponge and that was, that was the first real introduction to me about, I mean, really up close, what it really was and, you know, what it could do and, and, and how hard it is to work at that craft. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty good opportunity. Absolutely. So, so you, all right. So you saw him throwing, obviously he was shredding the league up. He went at Pittsburgh and tore up the Braves and I think the NLCS. So, can you tell us about when you first started throwing it competitively? Like, were you starting a back backyard adult league and and uh, stuff like that? Yeah. So uh, my story is kind of unique in the fact that so I was a catcher and a, and a shortstop like everybody else, and I pitched, but conventionally. But I was a you know low mid eighties guy, so I wasn't going to do anything in college as far as that goes. So I went to school as a catcher. Uh, actually, went to school to play hockey then. Uh, started playing baseball as a catcher. And then uh, what happened was uh, after college, I became an area County Sheriff and ended up getting sick uh, on the job while, while training, I ended up losing the job, uh, forfeiting the job uh, to no one's fault, just, uh, you know, something that happened. Um, and then started pitching in men's league and goofing around with it in men's league, you know, as a third pitch or whatever. And when I, uh, uh, blew my elbow out in men's league, I came back rehabbing. And when I started to rehab, I took it a little more serious. So when I started to take it more serious, I really, really put the, you know, the pedal down. I was throwing it in my backyard. I was throwing it in my dad's golf net you know, couldn't find anyone to play catch with. So, you know, as you lose catch partners, you feel like you're doing something a little bit better. Um, and at the time I was working at Rick Lancelotti's uh, baseball school, who, uh, who was a great guy and a, a mentor. Um, he had a friend that was coming through town uh, who worked for the uh, Tigers and saw me throwing it on the side that one day and just on a whim. And he said, you know, how old are you? What do you do? You know, do you play? And I said, no, I said, you know, I'm rehabbing. I'm coming back from stuff. And two days later, he called me and he said, Hey, uh, Rick gave me your number. I want to, um, I want to invite you down to Detroit and have you throw for some people. So of course, here I am. I'm excited as heck. I get in a car, I drive to Detroit, uh, I meet Greg Smith, who was the GM at the time and the major league pitching coach and, uh, um, and a, uh, a catcher there, a bullpen catcher in the tunnel at Tiger stadium. They're packing up to go to spring training. So the trucks are in the, in the stadium with me. I threw 10 pitches and they signed me. Now 
uh, it's unique, it's it's fun, but you also understand that at the time Steve Sparks was in the big leagues with them and excelling. So I think that they maybe saw an opportunity for someone to teach someone and and maybe bring something along and start a new trend. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty remarkable. It's uh, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of great things happen when you know preparation, right? You were throwing, you were preparing, and you know you're having fun with it, and then opportunity, you know, comes, and and uh, I mean that's how a lot of success happens. Um, okay, that's awesome. So uh, you you don't have a ball with you, do you? No, I can grab one. There's always yeah, one. Yeah, go around. grab one. That, just, you know, see your grip and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Give I can one pause second. it. All right, Joe. So can you show show the listeners maybe, I don't know, how you first started gripping the knuckleball and, and maybe, you know, did it change through your career? So when I first started gripping it, uh, I was always a horseshoe guy because that's the way Wakefield did. Um, I would find the Rawlings, the actual word. Um, I would get my fingers in there, in that horseshoe, um, and my pinky would stick. So uh, it would stick because I did. I felt like the more I pulled it down, the more yeah. pressure I would put on the ball. So I would stick it out um, and let these fingers do the work for me. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, you know, like like everyone else who's going to be a knuckleballer or who has, uh, you throw and it's great. And yep. then three days later, it's horse shit. So what do you do? <laughs> you move the ball. You yeah. Know, like it's the ball's fault or whatever. So yeah. um, through doing that for a couple of years and then talking to Phil Necro a little bit, he said, look, you stay with your grip, trust yourself and work on your mechanics. And then your cards, you just drop them on the table and it's there yep. or it's not. So I basically went back and I stayed with this pretty much uh, standard. Now, sometimes you'll get balls that are slick that you'll feel the seams are a little bit higher and it'll be a whole batch. In those cases, yeah, you make an adjustment. Um, but for the most part, that's how I was. All right. So you get a slick ball. I'm po- I don't know. All the balls are slick. What adjustment did you make in your grip? Uh, so if I had to get a little bit tighter, you know, not just, not just slick balls, but, uh, sometimes I had to, the ball would move so much that I had to tighten my grip Mm -hmm. uh, to, to make, take a wrinkle out. So I have to throw it a little bit harder to take a wrinkle out. In that case, I would find the small part of the ball because for me mentally, I mean, the ball's round, Yeah, (laughs) but mentally this felt like it was tighter the second I went to here. I can't um, see. Can you raise your hand, maybe? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, you went d- down the uh, the runway. So yeah. So I okay. here when I felt like I wanted to be tighter, but yeah. for, I mean, I'd say ninety percent of the time I was right here. Gotcha. Right in the horseshoe, just like yeah, you can find that everywhere. All right. Yeah, I know everyone's a little different. You know, kids start with like three, four fingers when they're younger, and then a lot of times they'll transition yeah, and, to that. And, you know, like I tell everyone, you know, not just knuckleballs, but anything, everybody's a snowflake. So everyone's different. Your hand size might be different. Um, you know, you might be dealing with a guy who's got small stubby fingers, in yeah. which case you might need three fingers on the baseball or yeah. someone's got really long fingers. So they might have to, you know, make that adjustment. Yeah. Um, Cause it's not regulated to hand size. It's not regulated to uh, arm swing. It's not regulated to anything. It's, it's it's more or less finding a comfortable grip to where you can repeat, repeat, repeat. It's no mm-hmm. different than putting a pair of spikes on that fit good so you can repeat your footwork or anything else. Yeah, I think that's key is like consistency coming down to, like you said, cleats, having comfortable cleats, pants, being comfortable, all that stuff. It, do the things that you can do that are within your control, which is going to help your consistency. Absolutely. And then, and then hopefully that peels off into mechanics and then your mechanics repeat, yep. repeat, repeat, you know, and again, you, when you're a knuckleball guy, you have less leeway. There's less margin for error because you're flipping it up there at 65 to 75 miles an hour. Um, yep. You know, when you're throwing 98 and you don't repeat your mechanics, it's still 98 miles an hour. So there's a little leeway. Now that's starting to go away as well, but 
I mean, let's be real. You know, yeah. guys, you know, if, 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 if the ball's up and it's 75 as opposed to 98, guys are going to choose to take the 75. Yeah. Yeah. People are going to tee off. All right. Sweet. And we'll, we'll bounce around here. So my next question is, how did your approach with throwing the knuckleball change when you first started towards the end of your career? Like, for instance, you know, some people get in the habit of, well, I'm going to try and make this thing nasty or I'm going to try to strike everyone out or, you know, maybe talk about your different approaches. So, uh, you know, it's funny because when I was first starting out, my numbers weren't very good, but I think my, my uh, attitude on, on what I was doing was probably the same as when I got old and I was, you know, throwing it at age 35 really well because I was just throwing it down a hallway and I was saying the heck with it because, because I was a, I was a nobody. I had nothing to lose, you know? Um, then as you get better and people take notice and you end up in, you know, double a and all these other things, all of a sudden you start to pressure yourself and you say, well, I got to make this one a little bit better. This has got to be a little bit. These players are a little better. I got to do this a little better. And, you know, you kind of find yourself getting out of what we just talked about with mechanics and everything else. And you start to shift and say, well, the guys aren't swinging and missing. And, you know, um, you go, uh, you know, you throw two really good knuckleballs and a, a guy swings and misses at both of them. And then you say, well, this one's going to be faster. And then it's terrible, you know. So mentally, um, the game starts to speed up as you get into higher leagues and you forget about what the main thing was that got you there. And that's no different from knuckleball pitchers to any pitchers who can slow the game down the most is, is what's going to happen. So then as I got older, I got back to that mentality. Look, this is who I am. My cards are going to be on the table, you know, do what I got, you know, now don't get me wrong. Uh, as I learned um, when I used to see guys get in the box, I could, you know, make adjustments on guys immediately because they're already making adjustments on me and I have thrown a pitch, you know, so uh, I, I would make adjustments like that and, and start to maybe use secondary pitches, fastball, and a little bit cutter and sink, um, you know, and like everybody else, there were hitters that hit me all the time. And then there were guys that just flat out couldn't hit it, you know, yeah. and then the guys in between are the guys you got to really make sure you stay within yourself. You're always going to have the guys that you dominate. You're always going to have the guys that for some reason hit you. doesn't matter if you're Randy Johnson or anyone else, but then the guys in the middle, those are the guys that you got to make sure that you don't overcompensate or, or forget about and just stay within yourself. And that's yeah, the thing I, I as I went on. I feel like, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, like for us, like, you know, coach gives you a scouting report on these hitters, right? Oh, man, he can hit a good slider, breaking ball, whatever. I feel like for us, it's, it's more important to stick to your game. You know, I mean, there's less adjustments. I feel like, hey, just stick to your approach. Don't worry about this guy. It's, you know, he's got 10 tanks on, on sliders or fastballs away. Just like know what you're good at, you know, stick to what you know and trust it through thick and thin. I feel like. Yeah. So I teach as a pitching coach, whether you're a knuckleballer or not, but, but to your point, um, more so with a knuckleballer is you're on the offense. Okay. So, uh, Baseball is the only sport where when you have the ball, supposedly you're on defense, right? That's the yep. only sport. Every other sport, if you got the ball, if you got the puck, you're on offense. Yep. So I teach the pitchers, you're on offense. So scouting reports are great. Information is outstanding. All yeah. the yakker tuck, everything that you can give someone is great. What you do with it is the most important thing. Now, as a knuckleball guy, I stay with what I do. I make him hit me. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I fall into a fastball count where I know that I – now I need to know, is he a pole guy? Is he a guy who, you know, is he on the plate? You know, does he like the ball up? Does he, you know um, – so that's where it will come into play. But, you know, I always looked at the guys. The first thing I did was I looked at walks. I looked at skill and bases as a knuckleball guy. So if the guy walks normally, because, you know, I was a one, you know, maybe one guy in the league. The guy walks a lot normally. I might be able to get away with a couple quick fastballs early in the count because he normally walks. So yeah. if he sees me, he ain't going to be up there hacked. Um, stolen bases, same thing. You know, uh, if he's running a lot in the league already, you know. He's going to try on you. 
Yeah, and again, I, like I said before, even with the hitters as well as with uh, guys who run, uh, I tell people there's guys that are just going to steal, and they outrun the ball. They're just that good, you know. No matter how many times you throw over, no matter what you do. Yep. Okay. Then there's guys that aren't going to lead off and do anything. Yeah. It's the average guys that you have to control in the base pass. And, and it's not a matter of picking them off or, or throwing them out. It's a matter of them not getting a huge lead because you're a knuckleball guy. So it goes back to you don't have to be super quick to the plate, but you have to mix up your looks and make sure that they're not getting walking leads, just like anyone else. Yeah. But those are the two things I looked at. I looked at the walks and I looked at the stolen bases. And then to your point, yeah, I went on my offense. I went on my stuff. Now, if I had to make adjustments, I had to make adjustments. But, uh, uh, but as far as scouting reports, yeah, I, 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 you know, maybe take a little bit something off. You know, if guys were fastball hitters, you know, you make it even slower. You know, yeah. The last thing fastball guys want to do is wait. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you mix speeds a good bit while you're, you know, through your career. Yep. So you would. I mean, what you probably hump it up to what seventies, low seventies sometimes. Yeah, seventy four. Down uh, to like fifty five. I, I would six sit at sixty seven, sixty eight, but and then maneuver from there. I mean, I've thrown I've thrown fifty eights up there, you know, depending on who it is. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, or, or just to give them a different look, you know. Yeah. Just put it in their head. So. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Sweet. All right. Um, it's talking about approach. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your, I don't know, preseason and in-season throwing program? What did it look like? Did you only throw flat ground? Did you only do mound work? Did you long toss, short, throw against the wall? What did that look like? So uh, as I started to play um, and I knew that I'd be going back year in and year out, um, when the season would end, I'd come home and I would do nothing. I would just shut my body down. And it wasn't a matter of arm fatigue or injury. It was just a matter of getting your body to accept something different and do something different. And then I would start up. I'd be skating, playing hockey or play basketball. And then I would start to get in uh, the gym and throwing a little bit. My gym program was more or less uh, rep, not weight. Um, it was so that I could uh, be flexible and uh, throw every single day. That was my only thing. And, my, and this was my own thought process was the bigger and stronger and the thicker my muscles got, the harder it is for me to rebound day in and day out. And my, my thing was always going to be that no matter what, if I was on a team, that my cleats would be on every single day. If I threw seven innings, my cleats were on the next day. You need an inning or two, you know, without being stupid and without hurting a team. Uh, I wanted to be able to do that every day. So as far as conditioning went, I did a lot of run. I, uh, again, I did a lot of rep, low weight, you know, high rep stuff. And then by November, I'm throwing. If I can get somewhere to long toss, because I'm from Buffalo, I would do it. Um, and I don't, I, I was never a flat ground guy. Uh, even if I threw short 45 feet, the catcher moved up. I never moved up. So uh, to me, if you're throwing on an incline or a decline, however you want to say it, um, that's how you should throw. That's how you should train your body to throw the knuckleball. Uh, if you're throwing it on flat ground, you're going to notice real quick when you play professional baseball, the best knuckleball pitchers in baseball are second basemen and right fielders. Because when they play catch with it, they play catch with it on flat ground, and they never get on the mound. And then the second someone gets on the mound and has a good one on the flat ground, it becomes a whole different animal. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I was I, I always thought of that uh, throughout my career. Phil Negro reinforced that with me. Um, now, if you can only throw off flat ground, then that's what you do, you know. Uh, but there's a lot, you know, we've spoken about this, you know, in the past, there's a lot of mechanics that are involved with flat ground as to opposed to, um, you know, the incline is because, you know, your foot hits the ground sooner, right? You know, and I tell this with guys, you know, when I coach conventional guys too, sinker ballers and stuff, I see them out there pounding flat grounds. What the hell are you doing? Get on the mound. You want to throw 15 pitches be uh, after you play catch? Do it on the mound. What, do you, what are you learning on flat ground? 
you know, if anything, you're learning how to get around the baseball and, and keep it at one level. There's no depth there. You know, the, 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 the positive part about the mound is it creates depth immediately. But if you're, you're so used to that black round and you're not used to it, then you're trying to force depth and everything else. And it becomes a, a kind of a snowball effect that, and that's my opinion. Now you'll talk to other coaches that will tell you black route is the greatest thing ever invented. You'll run yeah. into coaches that say long toss should be thrown at a hundred percent. I'm a long toss, get out to a hundred, 120 with a little bit of a hump, get your lat stretched and then start moving back in. You want to hump it up, get on the mound. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you, Joe. Like it's such a delicate pitch, right? If you, you know, it's a, everyone talks about feel like try to replicate it. You know what I mean? Like take, take, take the variables out and just get really good off the mound. Cause who cares how good it is on the flat ground? I mean, you, you, you're there to get better for the game off the mound. So. Yeah. I mean, to put, put it this way, equate it to a hitter. Yeah. And you're any good hitting coach will tell you <clears throat> hit off the tee a little bit to get your feel, get your rep. Don't hit it off the tee to, to hit the ball the other way and drive it. You're hitting into a net, right? Um, and, a, and really good ones will tell you about the, a month into the season, you don't even need BP. Hmm. You know, because it, what happens is it becomes draining and it becomes a home run contest. You know, now if you're throwing, if you're taking BP, uh, maybe a round or two, of seven swings to get yourself loose and, and, and work on your hands. That's a whole different animal, but wouldn't you like to take BP off a live pitcher instead? Yeah. You know, again, you're replicating. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you know, I can, I can, I'll go back to what we talked about in uh, the last segment. There is when the, when the lights go on and the game speeds up, you could have taken 10 rounds of BP, right? What's going to happen? Your hands are going to drop or whatever it is, Yeah, you know, because that's what it is. So you train yourself a little bit off the tee, but it shouldn't be your heart. And so you shouldn't be out hitting for two hours in a cage and not see any live, you know, live segments. And it's the same thing with pitching. You don't go out and throw a flat ground for an hour and then expect to get on the mound and get the same exact feel. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just kind of like, you know, reiterate what you're talking about, like Phil. I mean, that's what he had me do. He said, get on the mound. And he said, get the catcher up, start short, man. He's there to work with you and then have him work back. Just like get very specific. So, and if you can get it, so, so the idea is, is if you're good at 45 feet or 50 feet, you move them back to 60. And the second you throw, say that 10th pitch and you feel comfortable, you need someone to stand into that box because your eyesight are going to flip flop in a second instead of a gigantic background you're going to see a small window and what you want to envision is a tunnel or a, a, a large rectangular tunnel top to bottom not side to side and throw down that but the only way to train yourself to do that is to get someone to stand in there and get a good look yeah i i'm with you on that i mean yeah the strike zone is just this shrivels up and if you wait till the game for that, I mean, some people can get away with it. I, I'm not that talented, but once the game starts, you don't want that to be the first time you got to deal with a batter in there. Um, absolutely. I mean, even for me, Joe, like I was not the best. Uh, I try to simulate my bullpens where I would get on the mound and I would work on my holds. On uh, You know what I mean? Like, you know, when I was in college, I just come set. Bro, come set throw. You can't do that in the game. And, no. you know, just kind of what you said, you want to simulate. So, like, change your looks on the mound. I mean, you probably piss the catcher off, but throw in a fake pick. You know what I mean? Like, because that's what you're going to do in the game. Get off the mound, change your looks, get a batter in there. Yeah, and, you know, and as long as you're on the same page, your catcher, most of the catchers like that because they know they're behind the eight ball just to handle the pitch. Yeah. Then to catch and throw. Um they actually, you know, most of the catchers I loved or, or worked with was they loved it. They were like, thank you. You know, thank you because even the conventional guys weren't holding guys on and they're eating me alive. Um, 
and to your point, the simulation part, I mean, I've worked with you before. Don't you yeah. remember to get your heart rate up? We would run 10 sprints and yeah. get on the mound yeah. and throw a pitch. How do you slow yeah. yourself down? Yeah. You know, what, what is your body telling you? Speed yeah. up, slow down, or, or, or do I land? But most people say, oh, I got to get my heart rate down. Well, no, 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 no. What you have to do is lock it. Your heart rate will go down the second you lock in to what you're supposed to be doing, not yeah. everything that's going on around you. Yeah. yeah you got to find find what works for you to like, yeah, to slow the game down, which whatever it is, a breath, what you're looking at. Now, another thing, like when you were throwing, this is what I like to do is I would, Early on, I would just throw, right? And I wouldn't I wouldn't keep counts, you know? For me, what would help me and keep me accountable is keep counts. You know, you can just keep it in your head, like, all right, ball, 1-0. All right, hey, next pitch, 2-0. What are you going to do here, man? You know, like, uh, all right, fastball or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, if because you, you can get in the habit of throwing great, right? Knock balls are nasty, sexy, whatever you want to call them. But you just threw five balls in a row, like, it looks cool, but it's it's it does not play. So, uh, so that goes back to what I was telling you. You know, after you move the catcher back and you get through those ten pitches, get someone to stand in there, yep. and get your game in. Yep. He doesn't have to swing. I mean, if you if you're lucky enough to have a guy in there live swinging, great. But he doesn't have to. But he can let the hitter will let you know. You know, a, a good hitter will let you know, and they're not just you know you don't want a guy blowing smoke up your ass. You want a guy who's out there going ah. It rolled. It's a little flat. I see it out of your hand. You know, that looks different. That looks the same. Yeah. You know, good guy, good hitters, good guys that, that, that have an idea um, yeah. will, will do that. You know, you can't always go by the catcher because the catcher is going to tell you that it's great because he doesn't feel like catching you anymore. <laughs> so, uh, I would, I would, you know, the hitters will tell you, um, you know, good coaches will tell you. Um, and again, it goes like anything else. It's not necessarily the result as much as it is, is, you know, replicating what you're doing. If I, th if I see you throw three knuckleballs <clears throat> from the same arm slot, same mechanics, and the first two are really good and the last one isn't very good. I'm not going to tell you the last one isn't good. I'm going to tell you that they were all good. The last one just did what it did. Because what I don't want you to do is deviate from what you were doing that was really good two out of three times. It's no different than a sinker baller. It's no different than a breaking ball. You know, if your breaking ball is sharp and then all of a sudden one's not good, you don't try and get on top of it more because now you're deviating away from who you are and what you do. Yeah. A bunch of flip-flopping back and forth. That's driving you crazy. Yeah, it's and it's no way it's – like it's no way to live your life, <laughs> let alone yeah. pitching in front of, you know, 10,000, 20,000 people. You can't all of a sudden say it's not working. I'm going to throw it sidearm. You know, it's not working. I'm going to throw it harder. If you have to make an adjustment, you make an adjustment within yourself, not reinventing the wheel or your, you know, who you are. Yeah. All right. So can you, can you talk a little bit about maybe how your mechanics changed? Like, you know, maybe some checkpoints that you had, you know, from when you first started towards the end of your career, like, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, big chess, you know, we've talked a lot about it, you know, not, you know, you don't have to get out there and stride or, you know, what are some checkpoints that, that worked for you through your career? Oh, so for me, uh, one thing that I learned as I got uh, into video and stuff was uh, I would always make sure my hands were starting in the same place. Okay. I didn't worry about my arm swing. And when I was when I was first coming up, guys were like, "You have to be shorter." Some guys were like, "You have to be, you know, you, whoever you are." Um, and I took that to heart, and I would worry about my arm swing. <laughs> when uh, all of a sudden my hands would start to move, now my hands are all over the place, so my arm swing's different. So I, what I did concentrate on as I went on that I learned was. Just make sure your hands start in the right place. You know, I'm 100 years old. I'm, I'm not all of a sudden going to change my arm swing, right? So just start your hands in the same place, and everything else will just follow. Uh, that was one big one for me, um, you know, uh, landing uh, uh, in the same place, you know, not trying to overdo it. 
um, uh, with my stride was another one. And again, this is a big one for a lot of people because it's body type. I have short legs. You know, I'm six one, but my legs are not six one legs. You know what I mean? I have shorter legs, longer torso. Some guys have longer legs, so their stride's going to be a little bit longer. I mean, there's guys that are that are six foot who have longer legs than me, so they're going to get out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but for me, the longer you get out, the more that arm drags, and if that arm drags a little bit, as a knuckleball guy, again, goes back to the 98, 78, uh, if that drags, you're going to try and get on top, and you're going to get that tumble effect. You know, you're going to get this instead of staying here and through it, you get this way to try and catch up and get the ball down. And now you're manipulating as to opposed to just trusting who you are. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, Joe, we've worked a lot together. I'm going to maybe go over some of the things that you've shared with me, like, and, you know, maybe I don't make sure I remember them correctly. One thing you always talk about is you, you never want your arm beating your, I mean, you want your arm beating your body, right? Yeah. You never want, you know what I mean? Just, kind of what you were talking about there and i mean you know um another thing you always you always share with me is like i mean it's hit and miss right it's not you know this isn't for everyone it's talking about your can you talk about your glove side like getting in the way where i know at one time you know where you just had me drop my glove like just get your, your glove side out of the way can you talk about that and and what when when would you use that as a coaching tool well guys are so Naturally, so knuckleball guys are usually made after, after product. So like me, I was a catcher. Yeah. Uh, guys who blew out, they threw 95, they blew out. Guys who were 89, 90, average guys, good. Someone sees them throw a good knuckleball. So they're after, they're aftermarket guys, okay? Yeah. Um, but they're all taught, keep that front side in as long as you can. Pull yeah. down as hard as you can. Um, that creates your velo. That creates your spin rate. You know, um, we're opposite of that, right? Uh, I want that glove out of the way. So, like we talk about the old thing with the cat or with the second baseman and, and right fielders, you don't see them keeping their front side in when they're throwing a knuckleball at you. When you throw on flat ground, if you just play catch, I would say 100% of the time you're not trying to keep your front side in. You're just playing catch, trying to hit the guy across from you in the nuts. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So why would it change when you get on the mound to stay? Now you do have to stay closed until your foot hits the ground. But after that, um, I'm a big proponent in getting everything out of the way and letting say your right pack, if you're right-handed lead yeah. the way as to opposed to your left pack pulling down and leading the way, get it out of the way and let this guy come through because now I can stay behind the ball longer. And that's, again, that's a, a, a that's my opinion. Yeah, um, when I watch guys throw good ones. They're behind the baseball longer. And to me, the only way you're going to be behind it longer is if you do get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Another thing that always, you know, resonates with me. I know when I first started throwing, I was aggressive out of the, out of the, out of the glove. And then towards the end, you know, I'm, uh, I started easy back and I wouldn't get aggressive to till late can you talk about the importance of that or yeah, when so you I, was, sure. I was more of a slow to go so slow out of the glove then go when your foot hits the ground like hitting <clears> the gas pedal depending on your your arm speed and, and velo that you're throwing at um as far as the ball coming out of your glove i teach it no matter who you are i you know i had two guys throwing 98 last year I don't, I don't want anyone to pull the ball out of their glove. The ball should just come out of the glove, just fall yeah. out. So that, as a knuckleballer, is even more so, so you can stay slow to go. If you start to speed up, you're going to start to manipulate, and you'll notice that um, a hard move out of your glove Yeah, so... Uh so, uh, yeah, like I said, the coming out of your glove slow to go uh, is a big thing for me because, especially as a knuckleball guy, when you pull the ball out of your glove or yank it out, pull it out, however, you're going to have a tendency to tighten. It's like a guy who draws their hands as a hitter. You don't want to 
do that because your hands tighten. So if your grip on your knuckleball all of a sudden gets this way and then you're going back and all of a sudden you're looking for that feel again, you know, as to pose, it's easier to get that feel out of your glove this way as to pose it that way because there is only one feel when you yank. So uh, for me, that was a big one is, you know, come out and then get your feel out in front. Don't get trying to uh, get a feel out of your glove and then have to reinvent it. Yeah. I, when I was, when I was throwing good, it's, it was almost like I was loose. Like I was easy, loose. You know, when I got tight, it would start tumbling and everything got inconsistent. Like I wanted, I wanted to be loose up there. That was when I was throwing well, that's, that was something for me that I recognize. Well, and it, and it, it it'll project through your body you know the tighter you are in one spot in your body don't think that that's the only spot that's all of a sudden going to tighten because yeah. if you're working with one tight spot in your body something else has to tighten to to slow down momentum to uh, to get yourself back into a rhythm you yeah know, there is no rhythm with one thing being tight and other stuff being loose yeah you know um and and again i, I equate a lot of pitching to hitting yeah. You know, that tightness will come up maybe after release after you feel that that power yeah. come through. But other than that, you know, you're gonna want to be loosey goosey. Yeah. Like like Necro watching some of his video, he was like a slinky, you know, just kind of you know what I yep. mean, real whippy. He wasn't like real wiry, real whippy. And 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 again, that goes back to what I spoke about with off season routines. I didn't want to be bigger and strong. I did that when I was playing hockey. I got muscle, you know, muscle mass, I should say, where you're going to the gym to get your lower half stronger to compete in your upper half. You, you wanted more of the, the, for me, I wanted more of the whippy nature uh, within my arms, within my upper body and, uh, again. And it was more or less, not just for repeating my mechanics, but repeating my mechanics on an everyday basis. Yeah. Yeah, old Philip. I asked him. I said, "Hey, what'd you do in the off season? To get ready, you know, like conditioning." Oh, I just played ping pong with my brother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I well, mean, you got to remember too. A lot of those guys, and even me, and and I don't know how it is with a lot of these minor leaguers now because they get a couple bucks right off the nut. But yeah, uh, uh, you know, their workouts were were work. Like you know, we all had jobs in the off season. Yeah, we didn't go home and just do baseball. Yeah, You know, these guys, you know, and Phil and those guys, you know, uh, or anyone who played that era who's still around would tell you, yeah, they, they went home, the parents gave them a week off and said, head to the mine or head, yeah. you know, we're going to start uh, throwing fish, uh, you know, out at the, you know, out at the dock or whatever it is, or yeah. work at a, a mill. Um, yeah. So they got bigger and stronger by doing that alone, you know, and in Buffalo, you get bigger and stronger by shoveling. Sure. Not everyone's yeah. got to throw around. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so can you talk, you know, a little bit about your, um, I don't know, about your, a little bit more about your career, right? Like, you know, kids started this pitch, like they're going to face some adversity, Joe. Like it's not all rainbows and sunshine. I mean, can you talk about maybe your toughest outing in your career and, maybe, you know, some highlights about some of your best outings with the pitch. Well, I would say, you know, I don't know if there was a toughest outing. Okay. Um, you know, I had plenty of bad, bad games. Um, the one thing I prided myself on, uh, and which I learned from, you know, uh, my parents, my brother and sisters, and, and the coaches I had throughout my life, um, was I left it all out on the field. So if I was terrible, I was terrible, right? Um, uh, sometimes through fault of my own, sometimes not through fault of my own. You know, it is what it is. Um, I was never a stats guy. So I wasn't, in, you know, fingering through my stats and going, well, this should have been a hit or this should have been an error. I didn't care about any of that. I knew what my role was. So there'd be games where, uh, you know, I'd let up 10 runs, you know, but I got through seven innings. So, you know, is that a win? No, but it might be a win for the bullpen down the road in a couple of days. So, you know, by no means was I out having a beer, yucking it up. 
you know, it yeah. takes a beating on you. You know, I don't, I don't go out there expecting to let up a hit, let alone yeah. 10 runs. Um, you know, so there was a lot of bad games, you know, a lot of walks, a lot of trying to figure things out on the mound after the games, where's my career going? Uh, you know, but the good thing about baseball is it's every day, you know, yeah. and that's why I, again, go back. I trained myself to be able to throw every day. You know, uh, when you're a starter, sometimes it gets tough because you got five days, you know, sit and stew. That. On that, yeah. you know. But, um, you know, I always pride myself in saying the next day, hey, look, at you need me. I'm there, you know. Uh, and I think it went a long way with some of the coaches I had. I think they appreciated it. They appreciated I knew my role, what yeah. I was supposed to do. I never complained about it. You know, always wanted to help. So, um, you know, that was, uh, it's hard to say it was there one really terrible outing, yeah. you know. Uh, I was lucky to play in some uh, championship series and um, playoffs, and uh, I was lucky enough to do well in those. So I prided yeah. myself in the fact that when the, you know, when the stuff was on the line that they could go to me and not say, hey, suck up innings, because that's not what the playoffs are about, right? Yeah. Um, so I was lucky uh, and blessed enough to do that, um, and succeed in those, in those situations. Um, you know, the, the, the highlight of my career would have been when the guy from the Tigers said, Hey, I want you to come down and throw a bullpen. I didn't tell anyone, nobody knew that. Um, and I got to go down there and that guy he handed me uh, a, a letter saying, you need to call this person and arrange your play for so I, I immediately left there and called my father, who had no idea that I was even in Detroit doing this. Uh, so that would be a highlight because it was me explaining to him while he's working what happened and why, um, you know, and to hear him over the phone, uh, you know, with that kind of, wow, you know, uh, that was a highlight. Uh, I got a chance to throw uh, – uh, no hitter with Ricky Henderson playing left field for me, making the last three catches, um, uh, you know, a hall of, you know, unanimous hall of fame guy, you know, in left field. And that was like the only game he played left field, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, in that season for Newark. Uh, so, you know, those are games, those are phone calls, the players and the relationships you get from all the players, the coaches, fans, to this day, I have uh, what I call a family in in, in Southern Maryland, a, a family who put me up, who, you know, me and my wife consider like, you know, in-laws for us. Uh, we keep in touch with them. We visit them. You you can't you, you can't envision doing something that you truly love to do, get paid for, and then build relationships throughout the whole entire country, if not world with different people that you could call at the drop of a hat and say, Hey, it's Joe. And they, they pick up the phone and they talk to you. Um, you know, people don't realize, you know, when you, when you get starstruck with some of these players that are in the big leagues and stuff, you know, Phil Necro put me up at his house. He didn't know me. Yeah. You know, me and him were out having a beer, grilling steaks out on, you know, fishing. And he had known me for a couple of weeks, you know, um, so the relationships you build from people, the back and forth, I think it goes back to my upbringing and, and how I was brought up as being a good person. But at the same time, the people that I've been surrounded with uh, throughout the game uh, is just as important as career highlights. Yeah. Yeah, man. I think that's a good point because, you know, performances can go up and down, but yeah, you know, just be a good dude and, and be a good person and yeah, build those relationships. That's a, that's a big, uh, you know, big part of, you know, what we do, you know, if you're playing anywhere, you know, little league or whatever. Um, yeah, that's a big part of the game. So, um, <clears throat> well, Joe, you know, I know you've worked with a lot of guys, you know, with the pitch and stuff. What are, I don't know, what's like a roadmap for a kid um, that's maybe just starting out, say he's in high school, right? 
he's kind of messed on it, messed with it on the sidelines. And he's like, you know what? I want to make this a full-time gig. Um, what would you, you know, maybe three things, piece of advice you'd give to him. Well, you know, at that age, if someone's going to do that or at any age, I should say, but yeah. you have to commit, there's no flip-flop. You know, you can't all, say, uh, all of a sudden say, well, it's not really working. I'm going to go back to this now and then I'll revisit it. It's a, it's a full-time job. It's not a, um, you know, you have to train yourself if, if that's the road you want to go on. Now, if it's a secondary thing, then you treat it as a secondary thing um, and, and, you know, excel at whatever you can excel at, but, you know, treat it however, however you uh, prioritize it. If it's the number one thing, then it better be the number one thing and you better be ready to, to lose and lose a lot and you better be ready to hear a lot of coaches and people say no a lot but it only takes one yes it only takes one person to pat you on the back um you know and it only takes that one day where you say yeah i can do this yep but it's no different than anything else that you do in life it's no different than anything else you do in baseball uh you know guys who want to be switch hitters and they you know they do it and then all of a sudden they're like nope you know, yeah. uh, uh, so I would say commit, 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 uh, find yourself someone who is committed to helping you, uh, and that has some sort of knowledge, uh, or scope of, of what it takes to commit, uh, to, to the knuckleball itself. Um, there's plenty of people out there. And again, uh, we spoke at the beginning, if, if someone wants to call me, I'm all ears. I'll help anyone else, else I can, um, you know, within reason and whatever I can do for someone. Um, from there, it's going to be up to them. You know, put the work in. You got to be coachable. Um, and uh, the other thing is I would tell them is to go play other sports, especially in high school. Do what? Play other sports. Oh, Do yeah. Other things. Uh, yeah. Uh, especially as a knuckleball guy. You know, um, play some basketball because it'll play tricks on your mind. And sometimes you have to get away with it while at the same time uh, being athletic and, and, and enjoying yourself. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you, you, you need to play hockey seven days a week. I'm just saying, you know, as you work on your craft, have an outlet. And the outlet can't just be, you know, read a book or anything else, or the outlet can't be baseball. The outlet's got to be something else. So get your mind off the game a little yeah. bit. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and it'll help you to come back uh, with a fresh, you know, fresh take. And you'll be surprised, and, and I tell kids of all ages this, not just knuckleball guys, is the more sports you play, Okay, the more uh, ideas and realization that they all kind of fold in together, you know, and you'll pick up some tricks from certain sports to help you in your quest in baseball. Yeah. Um, uh, but going back to just being a knuckleball guy, commit. That's yeah. it. You, got, you, you have to commit to the ups and downs. And, you know, there is no uh, ABC. Um, uh, check mark because everyone's different but the one thing everyone has to have in common is you have to be coachable and you have to commit now it also helps to have someone who's somewhat knowledgeable i didn't have that person right away so i was self-taught like i was saying throwing in my backyard you know throwing in the golf nets my father killed me because i snuck over to his house the one day and i threw baseballs into the net and then two days later there was holes in the nets so he was uh, I wasn't overly excited about that, but uh, yeah. if you can find someone that can help you along the way, it's always good to have a, a, a mentor with, with knowledge and, um, uh, you know, a passion to help you not to help themselves. Yeah. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that you've shared with me and, and I think super important is, you got to pitch in the game. Like, I don't know if we talked about it or, or what, but like, if you're, if you want to go pitch, start in the men's league, find the worst team in the league, right? That needs pitching and say, Hey coach, I'll throw for you every day. You know what I mean? Every weekend, whatever. Just say, 
you can't you can't be picking the beginning. You got to get innings. Oh. You 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 have to pitch to hitters. You have to throw to hitters. You got to know what it's like to lose. You got to know what it's like to win. Yeah. Uh, you got to know what what it's like when the game speeds up. Yep. Uh, and you got to know what it's going to take to do it all and what you feel like the next day. Yep. I could, you know, I'm 180 years old. I can go out and throw a bullpen right now and carve up the imaginary hitter, right? Um, so would I be able to go out and feel my position? I don't know. You know, so, you know, and that's another thing that people, uh, uh, you know, I'll tell knuckleball guys is um, when, when I say commit, you commit to your craft, but you commit to your position, meaning you have to hold runners on better than everybody else. You have to field your position better than everybody else. You have to be smarter than everybody else, backing up your bases and, and those things. You have to do that better than everybody else on the pitching staff yep. it's because every coach will look for one reason to get rid of you and the yep. better you pitch the more reasons they'll look for it. you know you're out of shape you're not holding runners well coach i just threw a, a five innings no hit you don't field your position you know they'll find something but don't give them that don't give them that chance so like i said when you commit you commit to the whole thing it's not just going out there throwing bullpens and uh, to your point, you know, you got to commit and pitching games and get beat up and say, no coach, I don't want to come out of the game. I want to work through this. Um, yep. You've got to work on people rolling bunts out to you, your proper form so that you don't panic, making sure you're getting it out. Uh, you know, you got to work on slowing the game down, holding runners, counting to yep. five, stepping off all those good things. Yeah, I, and that was that's what me and you did. Like when I'd come work with you, we weren't doing sprints. We were sweating because we were feeling first on on a, on a, on a ground ball at first baseman, ground balls, you know, down the third baseline. I think that's that's what Phil told me. He says he didn't he hated running, but that's what he did. He'd grab a coach and he had him hit fungos, you know, fielding his position. That's how he got his conditioning. I think that's way better than just sprinting, like. Yes, yeah, so it's it's more of a it's a baseball uh, movement. Um, yeah. So I used to what I used to do is because I didn't always have people is I would line up twenty baseballs. <clears throat> yeah. And those twenty baseballs would be in the bunt areas, so there'd be a a, a, a row of ten. Yeah. And a second row of ten. <clears throat> so what I would do is I would go through my motion. I would run in field the first one, throw it, run back to my thing, my uh, position, throw, run back, get number two, and I would do 20. Yep. So then I would give myself a rest because you're gassed. It doesn't sound like a lot, but you're gassed. Yeah. Then I would do the same thing, throw in a third. You know, um, so there's your conditioning, and it's a baseball movement, which is always better than just a, um, a you know, you, you don't want to get stuck in the same gait, as they say, with running because it doesn't really work your whole body. Kind of like running on a treadmill. Yeah. You know, uh, are your hips moving? Are your, you know, are you doing those transitions with your feet? Not really. You know, the yeah. belt's doing it for you. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Joe, man, we covered a lot there. Um, is there anything maybe we didn't, maybe didn't talk about that, you know, you think is important for someone listening should hear? Uh, you know, I don't think there's any one thing. Uh, I think it's important that people know uh, that that the pitch is still around. You know, uh, um, it's we're in a situation now uh, with with kids nowadays that maybe don't want to put that commitment in. Um, I'm not sure, you know, um, but uh, for other people to carry on that legacy of the, of the pitch itself people are going to have to commit to it, you know, um, and then you're going to have to get breaks. You're going to have to have organizations to help you. You know, there's guys like Mickey Janice is out there right now who's got a good one. And, um, you know, he do well, he got all the way to the big leagues, but he's having a hard time finding that niche back in the game. Now the game's changing with the rules, et cetera. But again, that's just another reason for them to give you a no. Yeah. You know, give them a second reason to say, no, commit to everything that you're doing and, um, and if anyone needs any help, I'm sure that they can call you and, and and they can also call me. It doesn't matter where you are in the country or world. Yeah. I'll pick up my phone. If I don't answer right away, it's just because I'm old and it takes me a little while to get back to voicemails. 
Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, that's, that's part of this project is, you know, Joe, you know, you poured a lot into me and I've had, I've been fortunate enough and I kind of want to, yeah, I want to, I want to give back to the game and, and, uh, you know, build a network and, uh, you know, get to the bones of this. There's, there's not a whole lot of resources for this. So, you know, to inspire and, and, and get somebody started with the pitch because, uh, yeah, there's not a lot of guys throwing it now. So, um, awesome, dude. Well, Joe, man, I appreciate your time, man. Um, you know, uh, let's stay in touch, you know, <clears throat> maybe down the road, maybe do like a two, three minute video, you know, showing, maybe showing somebody something that worked for you, you know, yeah. whatever drill or something. So maybe we'll, we'll uh, collaborate on that. So um, that's the plan, dude. All right, whatever you need, you let me know. All right, so I appreciate it, man. Absolutely. All right, talk to you soon. All right.